Okay, and welcome back to another Behind the Knife Absite review. This is actually a supplement. Uh, this is not planned, but uh, a couple of my residents at my program put together a great PowerPoint, and I thought I'd share it with our listeners. So this first is attributed to Morgan Barron, uh, who put this together to teach us for Morning Report. And then my co-chief, uh, Jeb Black, uh, occasional uh, guest of Behind the Knife and longtime listener and friend, uh, updated it and made it extremely high yield for the absite so these are absite images much requested and we're finally coming through for you and uh, thank you jeb for putting this together and taking us through this absolutely kevin uh happy to be here looking through this stuff with you guys today so i i basically just put together this powerpoint of images that i thought would be as high yield as possible it's not any and everything that could possibly be seen on the on the app site, but um, they are things that that uh, we think will be helpful to know because a lot of times you know you get a picture um, and be expected to know what the diagnosis is, and that's really all the information you'll get and have to answer questions from from that. So we'll get started going through these. So we'll start off first with some abdominal imaging. So, Kevin, what do you think this is? So I see a big dilated colon. Uh, there's a few things that pop in my mind are Olgavis, sigmoid volvulus, sequel volvulus, or, and maybe like a toxic megacolon. Um, and, but given that this uh, looks more like a volvulus, it's really only colon you're seeing, and you see the mesentery pointing towards the right lower quadrant. The line of the mesentery is, if you follow it down, it's in the right lower quadrant. I'm going to call this a sequel volvulus. Yep, that's absolutely right. And that, that point about the mesentery kind of pointing towards where the volvulus is happening is is one that, you know, I think we heard recently and has helped me really nail this down in, in my mind as well. So along the same lines, so I'll, I won't belabor this too much, but this is, you can see the, the mesentery kind of pointing towards the left lower quadrant in this case. So this would be the sigmoid volvulus. Right. So the kind of classic coffee bean, a uh, few points to clarify here. Sigmoid volvulus, you're going to decompress endoscopically as long as they're not perforated and likely uh, do a sigmoid resection in the same hospital, say, depending on the health of the patient. Whereas a sequel volvulus, you're going to take straight back for um, a resection. All right. So here's another one. What does this look like? Man, that looks like the classic double bubble sign, which would be classic for duodenal atresia. Yep, that's exactly right. So duodenal atresia, remember the associations between that and some other congenital abnormalities. Um, that should get you at least a couple points on the test. And this will have uh, biliary emesis. Generally, the atresia is distal to the uh, ampulla. So what would you call this one? So I see that... Uh, there's not a normal duodenal sweep, and the small bowel is going to the right. And you said this is a child with a biliary emesis. Uh, based on those clinical cues, one of our biggest fears is malrotation. And another image that would be nice is the lateral to show that it's not going in the retroperitoneum. Uh, all those things would make me concerned for malrotation. Yep, that's exactly right. So this is malrotation. And like, like Kevin said, the important parts are the duodenum doesn't cross all the way over the midline. Your small bowel is kind of tracking along the right hemiabdomen. Um, and like you said, if you had a lateral view, the duodenum would not be retroperitoneal. All right. So here we've got another flat plate. The patient came in, some abdominal pain. What is this sign called? Yeah, this is a uh, slightly ominous. You see basically the dense uh, markings over the colon. Uh, I think that's classic for thumb printing. Uh, and so this is uh, consistent with colonic edema, um, sometimes infectious colitis, or ischemic bowel. Absolutely. So moving along in the abdomen. Now we've got this image from a uh, from an endoscopy. And then and you're looking at the ampulla. For those of you who aren't sure where we are, we're in the duodenum. This is looking at the ampulla vater. And what do you see there, Kevin? Is it a fish mouth sign? Yeah, so that's the fish mouth sign, and remember that this is this is um, fairly pathognomonic for a main duct IPMN, um, and so those patients are going to need to be worked up for that and require likely some type of resection, as discussed in previous behind the knife reviews. 
All righty. So you got an alcoholic comes in with an episode of acute pancreatitis four weeks ago. Now they've got progressive nausea and vomiting. You get a CT scan. You see this. That is likely a pancreatic pseudocyst. That's correct. And they're likely going to need some type of drainage procedure based on their symptomatology. All right. Same alcoholic, or I guess a different alcoholic, uh, had acute pancreatitis. He's got fever, chills, tachycardia, and hypotension. And now you've got this CT scan. So I'm seeing the air uh, in the kind of necrotic appearing debris near the pancreas. So I'm concerned about infected uh, necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, so this patient um, would likely need an aspiration to confirm that this is infected. Right. So you'll get an aspiration to confirm and then likely move along with your step-up approach. Obviously, if they're not responding, they may need to go to surgery. So we're going to jump in. Right. But I, I would choose, uh, we had a long debate about this morning report, but this patient and they're not actively dying in front of you, I would place a drain. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, so now we're going to move into some uh, liver masses and some common findings on CT scan. I, I didn't pull up any MRI images because I, even though I know these have characteristic MRI findings, I personally get them very confused in my mind, and I'm just better at looking at CT scans. So here we go. Uh, here's the first one, Kevin. So you see this uh, mass. It's got some peripheral, early peripheral enhancements um, and some homogenization, you know, when you get into your portal venous and late venous phases. What do you think this is? Is it a hemangioma? Yep. So that's a hemangioma. And then uh, got a slide here that's um, just showing you the, 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 don't get confused with this. This is a benign hepatoma or, or hepatic adenoma um, here. And just the characteristic findings that you're going to see there, are arterial phase on your CT scan shows uh, hypervascularity. Um, and these are ten, you typically uh, the same, look the same as liver uh, on the other phases. All right. So this one already got the answer there. It says focal nodular hyperplasia. Remember um, that these can uh, look pretty scary, uh, but they have that central stellate scar, and that's uh, fairly characteristic for the focal nodular hyperplasia. With a lot of these, you really just have to be able to recognize what they're getting at. They'll give you enough in the history to uh, figure out where the question stem is going. Um, so what do you think this is, Kevin? Uh, given that it has a thin wall, this looks like a benign cyst to me. Agreed. Yeah. So you got single lesion, thin wall, the, the, you know, there's no septations, there's nothing concerning uh, really around that, that, uh, that lesion there. It's likely a benign, <clears throat> benign hepatic cyst. So what about this one? That's scarier. Agreed. So this is a little more scarier. So this, this is more consistent with a hepatic cyst adenocarcinoma. Um, so you see those thick septations. It's got a very irregular border, uh, that sort of thing, encroaching on the other liver parenchyma, not just pushing it out of the way. So that's concerning for cystadenocarcinoma. All right. What about this? This one's a little bit of a zebra, but it's a pretty good one to know. Do they have a travel history? Absolutely. So they were in Mexico about a week ago, been having some diarrhea, now they come in with right upper quadrant pain, some LFT abnormalities. Uh, so I'm going to check serologies and treat them with flagell. I think this is an echinococcal cyst. So close. This would be more consistent with an amoebic cyst, which you're right with your treatment. You would treat that with flagell. Um, but that thick wall and a single cyst is a little more consistent with an amoebic cyst. The echinococcal cyst is going to look a little more like this. Now this is a pretty... Uh, gigantic one as far as imaging goes, but the echinococcal cyst tends to have multiple uh, cysts, kind of the daughter cyst you remember hearing about from your other reviews in the past. That's what this looks like. All righty. And then what about this? Uh, I see air in it. Uh, I'm going to think maybe like uh, they have diverticulitis and they have a hepatic abscess. Yep, so that's exactly right. This is consistent with a hepatic abscess. So you drain it and give them IV antibiotics and treat the source of the abscess initially. All right, 
And then, so this would be more consistent with the thing that we're all worried about when we see a liver mass. So um, you see hypoattenuation uh, of the liver, liver parenchyma that enhances um, with your arterial phase and then has early washout. This is most consistent with what, Kevin? Uh, HCC. Yep. So this is hepatocellular carcinoma. And this patient uh, would need to be, you know, worked up for either resection or transplant as necessary. Um, and then there's the other one that can sometimes uh, get confused between uh, focal nodular hyperplasia and this. Uh, what is this one? Is this a young patient? Yeah. So this is about a 30-year-old that came in with some right upper quadrant pain. Is this the fibrolamellar variant? Right. So this is fibrolamellar variant of HCC. Um, a lot of times they can look like the the uh, FNH as well, but um, they'll usually give you some things in the history that'll that'll help you figure out which one's which. All right. That was a little painful, but now we're going to move on. So uh, you're in the operating room. You get this image. What are we doing? What's the diagnosis and what's the next step? So this is an interoperative cholangiogram during a laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy, as you can see the laparoscopic trocars. Um, and so the good news is you can see the cystic duct filling, you can see the hepatic radicals filling, you can see the common duct filling, and you can feel, see the duodenum. All those are very important uh, pieces of it. But you do see filling defects uh, that appear to be, you know, about four stones that are moderately sized in the common bile duct. Exactly. So... These would need uh, further treatment with uh, either laparoscopic or open common bile duct exploration. If you're not able to do that, don't have the expertise, um, then move on with a postoperative ERCP. All right. So you got a patient who presents. All right. So this patient comes into the hospital. They had a gastric bypass a year ago, lost a bunch of weight. They were super happy. And now they've got a bowel obstruction and this finding on the CT scan. So you're seeing a swirl sign, and uh, this is classic for an internal hernia. Right, and those patients need to get to the operating room. All right, moving along with some more abdominal imaging. Um, so this is, uh, so you get this, uh, this patient's had some progressive abdominal distension. No one's really sure what's going on. You get this CT scan. What do you call this? Uh, this is very concerning for uh, pseudomyxoma peritoni. Yep, so pseudomyxoma periton peritonii or peritoni, however you like to say that, and then the sign that's being pointed to, what do you call that, Kevin? Uh, that's classic scalloping of the liver. Right, that's sick. liver scalloping and tends to be, uh, at least on test, fairly mnemonic for pseudomyxoma peritonii. All right, what's your diagnosis here? Uh, I see the strings... Uh, beads on a string sign here. Uh, this is consistent with classic for fibromuscular dysplasia. Absolutely. Um, and those patients, uh, depending on their symptoms, are potentially going to need some angioplasty. All right. Um, some head CTs that can commonly come up. What do you, what do you think that one is, Kevin? So I see the long... Uh, hyper-enhancing contrast along the entire skull, uh, which is consistent with a subdural. Yep, so that's a subdural hematoma. Some people call that the, you know, crescent-shaped uh, blood in the in the brain. And then conversely, you've got this biconvex shape that's, you know, also uh, can follow along your suture lines, and that's more consistent with an epidural hematoma. All righty. What about this? You got a target lesion there, both on your on your ultrasound and your CT scan. Intussusception. Yep, that's intussusception. If if it's in a child, obviously you'll you'll try um, your air contrast enemas to try and uh, reduce that. Um, if it's in an adult, they likely need to be explored uh, for a pathologic lead point. All right, so. Uh, Manometry can sometimes be a little confusing, and I put this slide up just so everyone can remind themselves of what the different uh, normal versus scleroderma versus achalasia, DES, and nutcracker esophagus sort of look like on traditional manometry. I'm not sure if 
high resolution manometry will show up on the test uh, this year. But, you know, this is what those tend to look like. A lot of times they've got the, the regular manometry superimposed over top of them. And the colors from sort of, you know, blue, green, all the way up to red uh, and, and orange are a scale of, of pressure. So the blues and greens are less, the red, orange, purples are, are more pressure. And so this is just a, a uh, uh, this is just an example of a normal uh, high resolution manometry with uh, conventional manometry overlying it. So we'll move on to some of the esophageal disorders. This is uh, normal manometry uh, compared with scleroderma. You'll notice there's esophageal aperistalsis, and importantly, distinguishing this from achalasia is there's a low esophageal sphincter tone. All right, so speaking of achalasia, what do you see here on this image, Kevin? So here you see the classic bird's beak. Yep, so it's bird's beak on your upper GI. It's very consistent with achalasia. And then here's what your manometry is going to look like. So you've got, you know, fairly normal swallowing mechanisms, but then you've got absence of peristalsis in the esophageal body with sort of dysregulated contractions. And then your esophageal sphincter tone is elevated down there at the bottom. It's a little more yellow than, than if you go back and look at the normal one I showed you earlier. All right, what about this? So here I see a huge amplitude throughout the middle of the esophagus, um, and it's it's kind of one simultaneous one. So uh, this would be uh, maybe nutcracker esophagus. Yeah, so nutcracker esophagus um, is a, it looks just a little bit different than this one. So this one's actually most consistent with diffuse esophageal sphincter, or sorry, diffuse esophageal spasm, um, where you've got these kind of simultaneous high amplitude contractions and there's no peristalsis. So you just get this huge wave of contraction that never goes away um, or takes forever to go away. Conversely, when you look at uh, nutcracker esophagus, it looks fairly similar to a normal esoph or a normal manometry, um, but your pressures during the swallow are just really, really high. That's the way you distinguish that between the other, the other two things. All right, um, and then this is just sort of a, this is a conventional manometry of a nutcracker esophagus. Not sure if any of these will actually show up on the test, but it's things that I got confused with uh, early on and, and wanted to make sure we were we reviewed. All right, some more upper GI stuff. So what does this look like to you, Kevin? That looks like uh, Zinker's diverticulum. Absolutely. So you got owl pouching in the cervical esophagus, consistent with a Zinker's diverticulum. And then what about this one? So this one appears in the mid-esophagus, so it's not an epiphrenic diverticulum. Is this a maybe a traction diverticulum? So this is actually isn't a diverticulum. Um, okay. If you look at that, yeah, so if you look at that middle picture there, um, you can see the esophagus is being kind of pushed in by um, a smooth contoured, uh, mass. And so this is a little more consistent with uh, a lyomyoma of the esophagus. All right. And another thing that um, took me a while to really understand was uh, endoscopic ultrasound and what the different layers look like. So I just put this picture up, uh, found all these, you know, I found all these pictures online. Um, they're pretty easy to, to get in a hold of. Um, so uh, Look over this when you get a chance uh, so that you understand what's the mucosa, what's the submucosa. And it's pretty much just alternating layers of, uh, you know, darker material versus the, the more echogenic, or excuse me, the lighter, lighter layers. Um, your muscle tends to be darker on these endoscopic ultrasounds versus the, the connective tissue layer. So that's one way to remember it. Um, they may show you an ultrasound that, that has a mass that's penetrating through a layer. I'm not sure that they would get that detailed on the test, but the more you know, right? All right, Kevin, we do a lot of bariatrics here. What does this look like? So it looks like this patient has a uh, laparoscopic gastric band, or at least a gastric band, and uh, it, the phi angle looks uh, that it is not correct in this patient. Right, so your phi angle, or we'll look at this next picture. Um, 
your phi angle is is important um, in these gastric bands, and it's the angle between the the a line drawn bet- straight up and down through the spine, and a line drawn uh, straight through the band. That should be less than sixty degrees. Some people would say less than forty five degrees to be in the right location. And then if you've got so this patient has a big gastric bubble above that, um, so that's concerning for what we call a slipped band. And if they've got disfit or um, vomiting and abdominal pain, then that band likely needs to come out. But what's your first step? Uh, remove the saline. Yep, remove the saline. A lot of times that'll help with their symptoms. All right, so you get this colonoscopy. What's your diagnosis? So this looks like FAP to me. Yep, FAP, and remember the gene involved is the APC gene. All right, this is just kind of some other random images that may show up. So you got an unstable trauma patient with that band of uh, black in between their liver and kidney. Your next step? Uh, X-lap. Yep, take them to the OR because they're probably bleeding. All right, uh, we got a CT scan, elderly patient that came in with some trouble swallowing, some reflux, maybe some pain. What is this? Looks like a parasophageal hernia. Yep, parasophageal hernia. All right, this patient came in hypotensive, febrile, tachycardic, had a history of C. diff colitis. What's your diagnosis and what do you do? So history of C. diff, this sounds like a toxic megacolon. Yep. And if they're septic and hypotensive and getting worse, what's your treatment? Uh, total abdominal colectomy with end ileostomy. Absolutely. Uh, continuing a little further. Uh, all right. So you uh, take a patient to the operating room for what you thought was appendicitis. You get in there and instead you see this. What is this called? Uh, well, this looks like there's creeping mesenteric fat around the ileum, most likely, and uh, so that's consistent with Crohn's. Absolutely. Creeping fat and Crohn's disease. All right. You got an 80-year-old patient, uh, comes in with a bowel obstruction, has a history of maybe some right upper quadrant pain. You get this CT scan. What's your diagnosis? If you heard my mock orals with Dr. Christian Jones recently, uh, it took me way too long to come to this answer. Uh, This is clearly a gallstone ileus. Absolutely. Gallstone ileus. And the treatment? The treatment is X-lap and uh, removing the stone. Absolutely. All right. Now we're going to move on to some other uh, images. We'll get a little bit out of the uh, radiology realm and just into some things that may be shown to you in the uh, pathology uh, or just physical exam findings. Um, First off, review the Malampati classifications. This is one of those visual things that I just have to look at and remember. Um, Kevin, can you run us through uh, just quickly what you remember about the Malampati and what's, what do you think is important for the test? Yeah. So for class one, uh, you need to be able to see the entire soft palate. So the uvula and then the soft palate behind it. If you have space between, significant amount of space between the base of your or the tip of your uvula and the base of your tongue, that's pretty uh, classic for a class one. For class two, you need to be able to see the entire uvula. So um, you, the tip of the uvula may just be over the top of the, the back of the tongue, and that's all you need. Uh, for class three, you're only going to see the base of the uvula. You're not going to see the tip. You're not going to see any of the soft palate, and that'll be a class three. And then a class four is if you can't see the uvula at all. Excellent. And what if you look in the patient's mouth and you see this? Looks scary. What is that? Uh, that is... Taurus palatine? Yep. Taurus palatini, and unless they're extremely symptomatic, you really don't have to do anything about it. All right. Uh, One thing I wanted to review with everyone was thyroid nodules. You may get an ultrasound that shows a thyroid nodule. This is an example of a normal one. Uh, You've got a fairly, you know, it's about as wide as it is tall. There's no calcifications. It's got regular borders with a nice little rim around it. So that's a normal thyroid nodule, uh, likely benign, maybe hyperfunctioning. We're going to contrast that to this image of a abnormal thyroid nodule. So you see the internal calcifications. um, The borders are irregular. It's a little wider than it is tall. So all those things are concerning for uh, thyroid carcinoma. All right. What if you see this, Kevin? What is that? 
Uh, is that a somoma body? That is a somoma body, uh, consistent with papillary thyroid carcinoma. Another thing consistent with uh, papillary carcinoma is, so these are large cells with lots of cytoplasm. They've got their nuclei kind of sitting off to the side. What is that? Is it an orphan ante nuclei? Yeah, so that's the classic orphan ante cell. There you go. Going all the way back to med school pathology with some of these. All right, so you got a patient that's had a splenectomy for whatever reason, and they've got different findings on their uh, peripheral smear. So what's that one, the short arrow up there in the left uh, upper part of that image, what is that? The short arrow in the upper left, is that a target cell? Yeah, that's a target cell. What about the long arrow in the right bottom? What would you call that one? Mm, That's a funky one. Uh, Schistocyte? Yeah, uh, some people call that an acanthocyte, schistocyte. There's multiple different names for them, but uh, all of these are just peripheral smear uh, things you may see in somebody who's had a uh, splenectomy. What about that last one? Is that a Heinz body? Uh, It's a Howell Jolly body. Close. All right, and then this one you already mentioned. So this is actually the Heinz body. All right. What does this patient have? Uh, sickle cell? Yeah, so that's a smear from sickle cell disease. And what about this patient? Hmm. You've got small, oh, uh, round... Spherocytosis. Yeah, so it's spherocytosis. And you can differentiate the, the spherocytes from regular blood cells because they don't have the typical uh, kind of clear portion in the middle. Remember, a normal red blood cell should look a little bit like a donut. If it doesn't look like that, you got to be concerned for spherocytosis. All right, on to some more physical exam type findings. Baby's born. They've got this finding. What is this? This is gastroschisis. Yep, gastroschisis. And then contrast that to this finding. Here they have a peritoneal lining, and this is going to be direct through the umbilical stock. This is an omphalocele. Yep, remember those uh, differences between gastroschisis and omphalocele. Remember that omphalocele is typically uh, or more commonly associated with uh, other congenital abnormalities. All right, they may show you an x-ray of uh, some broken bones and ask you what to do with it. So what do you do for this one, Kevin? Uh, For this one, I would do an open reduction internal fixation with intramedullary nailing. Yep, so femur fracture, the mid-shaft, they need intramedullary nail. That's the important distinction that may be made on the uh, test. All right, so here's an image of a lower extremity angiogram. Uh, You may see this, and it's something that uh, people get confused fairly often. Remember that the anterior tibial uh, comes off first, off the uh, popliteal artery, when it splits into the anterior tibial and the uh, perineal trunk. And when you're looking at this uh, on an AP uh, image, the anterior tibial artery is going to be lateral um, to the perineal trunk. Uh, And then the perineal trunk is going to separate into the perineal artery and the posterior tibial. Posterior tibial is going to run more medially, and the perineal trunk is going to be a little bit more lateral. So from lateral to medial, you've got AT comes off first, your perineal trunk is next, and then your PT is medial. All right, Kevin, what is this? This is condyloma. Yep, so condyloma acuminatum. Just some other physical exam findings you might see. What about this one? This is a rectal prolapse. Absolutely, rectal prolapse. All right, moving on to colonoscopies. So a couple things that they may ask you to distinguish between is UC or Crohn's based on some uh, colonoscopy imaging. What do you think this is, Kevin? So I see pseudopolyps on this, so I'm, I'm thinking this might be UC. Yep. So this is ulcerative colitis. Uh, Those are pseudopolyps. We'll contrast that here in a little bit to the cobblestoning that you see on ulcerative, or excuse me, on Crohn's disease. Uh, One of the other findings that uh, I read a little bit about this year was hypervascularity in ulcerative colitis. So you may see a picture of that, and there's a representative image there. And so this is that cobblestoning we were talking about um, in Crohn's disease. Um, you can see that there's some, you know, just heaped up borders. Um, it's not quite the same as the pseudopop. So kind of just so you know what the difference is there. What about this, Kevin? What are, what do you call those? 
Are those uh, aphthous ulcers? Yeah, so those are the aphthous ulcers that you see in Crohn's disease. All right. Uh, this is another thing that you might find with uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. This is pyodoma gangrenosum. This will about half the time resolve whenever you've treated, especially with ulcerative colitis, whenever you've treated the ulcerative colitis uh, and taken their colon out. Um, sometimes you may also see this next to an ostomy. You might see a picture of that. So um, just so you know what those images look like. What about this finding, Kevin? This is the classic uh, erythema nodosum. Right, so anterior uh, lower leg erythema nodosum will typically get better with treatment. All right, uh, moving on to some findings in uh, breast cancer. So what is this classic uh, physical exam finding? Is that the peau de orange? Yeah, so peau de orange or however you like to pronounce that. Uh, very concerning for inflammatory breast cancer. What about this finding? Is that uh, Paget's? Yeah, so that's Paget's disease, this kind of scaly, erythematous, almost looks just like a rash. Uh, don't be confused and treat that as such. They need to have appropriate workup and treatment for breast cancer. Uh, what about this patient who had an axillary dissection done after her breast cancer uh, five or ten years ago? Now she comes back with this lesion. What are you worried about? Uh, worried classically about angiosarcoma. Yeah, so this is the classic Stuart Treves syndrome, lymphangiosarcoma uh, in the setting of lymphedema. Uh, now we're just going to go through some uh, classic findings of skin cancer real quick. Uh, this is obviously basal cell carcinoma with the rolled borders and telangiectasias. Uh, these are some representative images of melanomas. What about this one, Kevin? That one looks uh, more like squamous cell to me. Yeah, so... More likely to be squamous cell just uh, based on the, the lack of the brown discoloration that you typically see with melanoma. So we're going to contrast that to this finding. What's this, Kevin? Uh, this looks like a classic precursor to squamous cell. I think it's called actinic keratosis. Absolutely. And remember, it's going to have that stuck-on appearance. It looks like you got you know just some crusty stuff stuck to the skin with a little bit of underlying uh, skin changes. All right, uh, so you got this patient that comes in. They've got you know these kind of weird plaques on their on their hands and feet. Uh, what is this, and what are you concerned about in this patient? So, a lot of times these patients may they give you in the history some dysphagia. Uh, so these look like palmar and plantar keratoses, and with dysphagia in the history, you'd be concerned about esophageal cancer. Yep, so these have an association with squamous cell cancer, the esophagus, and you got to be concerned about that if you see this physical exam finding. What about this rash? What is this, and what are we worried about? So this is one of our pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is associated with this. This is the uh, classic finding of a glucagonoma, also called, the skin finding is called necrolytic migratory erythema. Right, Absolutely. What about this skin finding? Uh, you st recently, this patient was in the hospital, had a PE. Maybe you started them on some anticoagulation. Well, yeah, due to the protein CNS having a shorter half-life, uh, you actually become hypercoagulable shortly, and you can get warfarin-induced skin necrosis. Absolutely. So that's all the main pictures I, I have for you, for you guys right now. Um, definitely not comprehensive. There, go ahead. And... Uh, Jeb is going to be a trauma surgeon next year, and so he had to talk about TEG. Um, this is, apparently it's showing up, according to Dr. Martin, on the general surgery boards now. Um, so anytime now, it could show up on the ab site. So um, and given that he's a trauma nerd, he had to get, uh, sneak this on. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think it's high time that this showed up on the ab site, and not everyone uh, is very well versed in TEG. It's not something we use at our hospital yet. Um, so for those of you who use it every day and don't need to listen to the next five minutes or so, you can go ahead and turn the podcast off now. Otherwise, uh, for those of us who aren't quite as versed in uh, thrombo thromboelastography or uh, the Rotem, I'm going to do a quick primer for everyone. So there's Really, on the TEG, there's really five times and probably f or five different measurements. Four of them, I think, are truly important for, for what may show up on the test, but we'll just run through them quickly. 
So you have your R time, which typically uh, is normal is somewhere between five and ten minutes, and this is uh, basically measuring your coagulation factor. So if you've got a long R time, uh, you would give somebody FFP. Um, your K time is a little bit more complex and has to do with the interaction between um, platelets and and uh, your fibrinogen, as well as some of your co coagulation factors. And if, if that time is increased, usually you would treat that with cryoprecipitate. I don't think the K time is necessarily going to show up uh, as a question. Uh, the R time being extended definitely will, um, if, if that's... The R time being extended, I think, very well could. Uh, your alpha angle then has to do with how fast your clot is forming. Uh, and has a lot to do with your platelets uh, as well as your fibrinogen, um, mostly your fibrinogen, though. So if your alpha angle is low, you're going to give cryoprecipitate and then consider giving platelets. The maximum amplitude, or this MA here, has to do with how th uh, thick of a clot is formed and is entirely due to your platelets, at least on the tag itself. So if your maximum amplitude is low, you're going to give platelets plus or minus DDAVP if you think you have a uh, qualitative disorder in your platelets. And then finally, this LY30 or the lysis at 30 minutes um, gives you an indication of how much fibrinolysis is going on. And so a normal value there is somewhere between 0 and 3%. Some some sources will say up to 8% can be normal. But if that is high, meaning you've got lots of uh, lysis going on, then you would give TXA to those patients. The way I think this most likely will show up, um, if it does, is they're going to give you a picture and ask you what to do with the patient or ask you what the diagnosis is. So up here at the top, you've got a normal TEG tracing. You can see a short R time, a fairly steep alpha angle, a nice wide maximum amplitude, and minimal lysis at 30 minutes towards the end. What about this first one, Kevin? You've got this really long R time. What would you be worried about in that patient? Um, oh, so I was supposed to pay attention to the last segment. Okay. Um, R time. Uh, that would be a lack of coagulation factors. Yeah, so they're hyper -co or hypocoagulable, excuse me, or they're on anticoagulants. Um, and so you're going to treat them w initially with FFP, um, unless they're on one of the novel anticoagulants, obviously, those other treatments for that. Uh, what about this second one? Your R time's pretty normal. The rest of it looks okay, but it, your maximum amplitude's kind of low. So you told me the maximum amplitude was uh, related to platelets. Um, so I'm going to give them platelets or desmopressin. Yep. So you got reduced platelet function or low number of platelets. And so that's exactly right. Platelets or desmopressin. What about this next one? This is pretty classic for uh, a specific uh, problem in trauma. Um, so it seems like they're, is it their fibrinolysis? Is yep. So that's exactly right. Um, you've got hyperfibrinolysis. Uh, so your clot started to form, but then your body was a little overzealous in the fibrinolytic pathway. And so you're going to give those patients TXA. Uh, just as a bonus, these last three um, are some other findings that you might find on TEG. If you've got a really wide maximum amplitude, as you do um, there, then that's just a patient that's hypercoagulable. you got to worry about why they're hypercoagulable. This next one uh, is a patient that's hypercoagulable, but then uh, has a hyperfibrinolytic response. Uh, and those patients are in stage 1 DIC, uh, which is hypercoagulable state with secondary fibrinolysis. And then when everything uh, is starting to shut down, you've got a long R time, you've got a very low maximum amplitude. Uh, those are patients that are hypocoagulable uh, in second stage DIC. Uh, that was by no means a comprehensive review of TEG, but it's just some high points for everyone. Hopefully, if TEG question shows up this year on the test, you'll get it right. Um, good luck, everyone. Uh, have fun studying uh, and have even more fun at your post absite parties and dominate the absite. Awesome. And that was Jeb Black with his image review. Thanks, Jeb.